Good morning. It's good to see everybody out this morning to assemble together and worship God as one. It's been a joy to be here with you all this morning. Over the past couple of months now, we have been uh, working our way through a, a broad topic that the elders presented to us as a theme for this last trimester of the year, committed Christianity. And there have been a lot of sermons presented on that topic, and this is one of those. Now, as we're nearing the end of the year, we're starting to come toward the end of this topic. And this is a topic that Keith presented when he, he set forth this uh, theme for us to consider for the last trimester. He, he wanted to ask us the question, and really have each of us ask ourselves the question, when we consider our place in the Lord's church, when we consider our mindset toward our brothers and sisters, would we best be described as givers or as takers? Now, there's a reason that's an important question to ask. There's a lot of reasons that's an important question to ask. But one of the reasons that that question is so important for each of us individually to address is because givers and takers are both culture changers. They are trend setters. They strongly influence the culture of a local church. They strongly influence the culture of a business. They strongly influence the culture of a family. They strongly influence those that they are around. And we're going to talk this morning about ways in which they influence those. But it is important to remember that this question requires our attention because as we talk about the local body of Christians that assemble here at Traders Point, our culture is going to be influenced by your answer to this question this morning. Your answer to this question is going to influence me. My answer to this question is going to influence you. And our answers to this question are going to influence the local body here. You know, we're coming up on a time of year in which we are confronted with uh, this question in a very physical sense. When you think about the holiday season and gifts being exchanged, we realize that there, this time of year promotes within us a sense of giving. We give gifts to other people. It can also present a challenge of materialism as we think about getting things from other people. But what I want to suggest to you this morning is I'm not asking the question, is whether you, do, you, do you like getting gifts or do you like giving gifts? That, that may be a, a symptom of what we're talking about this morning, or that may be an indicator of what we're talking about this morning. But when I ask you the question, are you a giver or a taker, I am asking the question, what is your mindset around these things? Where is your heart when you think about being a giver or a taker? One other just point of clarification as we begin there, there are always going to be times in our lives where we need something from other people. I may need your help spiritually as I seek to work through something. Or, or perhaps physically, if we come upon hard times or we're sick or those types of things. And, and we need help from other people. Again, that is not necessarily what we're talking about this morning. We are put in each other's lives to help one another when that help is needed. But what is your mindset? How do you approach your life? How do you approach interactions and relationships with other people? That's the question that I want us to address this morning as we consider whether we are a giver or a taker and what changes we may need to make. So let's talk about what each of these are. And then we're going to spend the remainder of our time uh, looking at some biblical characters and some of the characteristics that are shown to us in Scripture of each of these types of people. But as we begin this morning, now when, when we think about givers, here are some things that I want you to keep in mind. A giver is someone 
who has the heart of a servant. A, a giver is someone who is humble in nature. They're always thinking about someone else. They are selfless in the way that they approach life, in the way that they approach the world. They are selfless. They're always looking out for others' best interests. They are generous with their time, with their energy, with their money. They are loyal. They're not going to turn their backs on their friends in a time of need. They're going to be there. They are loyal. They're hard workers. And they're always asking the question, what can I do for someone else? And that leads them to the conclusion that as a giver, I owe everything that I have to God. As Keith pointed out at the table this morning as he was talking about our giving, Givers understand that we are simply stewards, and that anything that I have, I owe to God. But on the other side of that, here are some characteristics to keep in mind when it comes to takers. And you'll notice that they are oftentimes very much just the opposite of what we see in the givers category. Instead of being servants and selfless, they are selfish. It's all about them. And when everything is all about you, and when you are selfish, that leads to worry. That leads to anxiety. They're lazy, not hard workers, proud, and unlike the givers, instead of asking, what can I do for someone else? They are asking, what can someone else do for me? And so, that leads to the mindset that instead of me owing everything that I have to God, I view the world as owing me. Givers and takers. Which are you? And what are some areas in our own lives where we need to make some changes? Let's look at some biblical examples together to further unpack each of these. And we're going to start with some biblical examples of takers. Now I'm going to have on the screen behind me some, uh, some passages of scripture for each of these. We'll look at some of them together. We're not going to read all of them. The first one, you'll see very much why, because it's multiple chapters long. We're not going to read all of these together, but if you'd like to take some notes and look at these later on your own, you are welcome to. The first taker that I want to draw your attention to is King Ahab. His story takes place in the book of 1 Kings, and really verses six, or chapters 16 through 22 tell us the story of this wicked, selfish king. Look specifically with me in chapter 16 of 1 Kings, and beginning in verse number 30, look at what is said about King Ahab. Now Ahab the son of Omri did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. And it came to pass as though it had been a trivial thing. For him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took a wife, Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbal, king of the Sidonians, and he went and served Baal and worshipped him. You can follow the story of Ahab throughout the text that I just gave you, and what you'll find is a man who is all about Ahab. That's what his entire life is about. His entire life is about power. His entire life is about wanting. So much so that a few chapters later, in 1 Kings chapter 21, we're told the story of King Ahab, a king who had everything at his disposal, coveting the vineyard of a man named Naboth, and wanting it so badly that he went to the extreme, he and his wife Jezebel, of killing him, so that he could have what he wanted. The world owed him. The world owed Ahab in his mind. 
he approached life saying, I deserve this. I deserve to be king, I deserve to be honored, and if I want something that I can't have, I'm going to do whatever I have to do to get it, because I deserve it. He was a proud man, a selfish man, a self-centered man, a taker. Did he influence the culture of the people around him? He absolutely did. Certainly as king, he had power and he had authority. And he used that taker mindset to influence others around him in the same way. And as such, he led many away from God in his time as king because of the mindset that he had. Another example of someone who I believe could be adequately described as a taker is Judas one of the twelve apostles that Jesus chose. But a man who we see in Scripture was all about himself. Look at a couple of, of examples with me. Look in Matthew chapter 26. This being at the end where he betrays Jesus. Let's just read these words together and think about Judas in the context of what we're talking about and see if you see some of these traits in what we're told about him. Beginning in verse number 14 of Matthew 26, Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? And they counted out to him thirty pieces of silver. So from that time he sought opportunity to betray him. What are you willing to give me? When you think about Jesus calling the apostles, he talked to them about the fact that following Jesus meant leaving all behind. That following Jesus meant forsaking many of the earthly possessions that they may have had. That was part of following him. Judas looks around and he says, well, the world owes me something. The world owes me something. Look at all I've given up for this guy. What's in it for me? Greed, disloyalty, betrayer, and like Ahab, a mindset that screams, I deserve this. The last example of a taker that I want us to consider is Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5. We won't go and read that this morning, but you can reference that if you'd like. It's probably a story many of you have read before. Ananias and Sapphira, a husband and wife, who lie about what they have sold a piece of property for as they give a portion of it to the apostles to use uh, among the brethren there in Jerusalem, but they keep a portion back for themselves. Uh, But they do so in a dishonest manner. Uh, They lie about that. And even the point is made there in that text. Listen, while this property was yours, you could do whatever you wanted to with it. Nobody was making you sell it and give it to us. It was yours. But you lied about it to make yourselves look generous. They looked from the outside as a giver, but their mindset and their heart screamed taker we see greed we see dishonesty and similar to what we've seen in Ahab and Judas I deserve this I worked hard to get this land or this property I I deserve to keep a portion of that what's in it for me and of course as we look at all three I guess technically four, of those people, those examples on the screen behind me. I want you to just take a moment and think about the outcomes for each of these people. Ananias and Sapphira struck dead because of their dishonesty and their greed. Judas, in embarrassment and regret, 
hangs himself. Ahab and Jezebel, for that manner, meeting gruesome and untimely deaths, full of pain, full of agony, because of the decisions that they made. Being takers in the eyes of God is not something to be taken lightly. God hates this mindset. It goes against everything that he is and everything that he wants us to be. Now I will give you that the examples on this screen perhaps are on the extreme nature of what we're talking about this morning. But I would also challenge us to recognize how easily it would be for us to begin to have some of these same thoughts and some of these same mindsets as we approach the world around us, as we approach the physical things that we have in our possession, as we approach the relationships that we have with others. We are not above falling into some of the same traps that we see these individuals falling into. Well, let's look at some givers. Let's look at the other side of this equation. And let's look at some biblical examples of givers. And the first one that I want you to look at in Mark chapter 12 is a story that we see of a woman who comes to give at the temple treasury. And Jesus watching her, let's just read this together beginning in verse number 41 of Mark chapter 12. Jesus sees this poor widow come to give. And I want you to listen to how he responds upon seeing what she puts into the treasury. Beginning in verse number 41 of Mark chapter 12. Now Jesus sat opposite the treasury and saw how the people put money into the treasury. And many who were rich put in much. Then one poor widow came and threw in two mites, which make a quadrants. So he called his disciples to himself and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who have given to the treasury. For they all put out in their abundance, but she out of her poverty put in all that she had, her whole livelihood. Now again, I want you to remember the fact that what we're talking about this morning is not necessarily the amount that was given here. If that was the case, if we were talking about the amount that was given and then drawing the conclusion about whether they were givers or takers then the rich people in this story would have been the givers because they put in a whole lot more money than this poor widow did. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the mindset that drives people to action. And the mindset of this poor widow was a mindset of selflessness, of generosity, and of a recognition that while she had very little, everything that she had, she owed to God. And so that drove her to extreme action. To give all that she had. It may not have been much, but I want you to think about however much or however little you have, I want you to think about giving it all away. I'm not suggesting that God calls us to do that, but what I'm suggesting to you this morning is that God calls us to have the mindset to be willing to do that. And to recognize that everything I have, I owe to God. And my full trust and faith is in Him. Another example is the Apostle Paul. We can look at a couple of examples together. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and we'll look at one instance in which we see these mindsets and these attitudes that we've been talking about present in the Apostle Paul. Look with me beginning in verse number 19 of 1 Corinthians chapter 9. For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant 
to all, that I might win the more. And to the Jews, I became as a Jew, that I might win Jews. And to those who are under the law, as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law, as without law. Not being without law toward God, but under law toward Christ. That I might win those who are without law. To the weak, I became as weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Now this I do for the gospel's sake, that I may be a partaker of it with you. That is the very definition of a giver right there. Someone who recognizes that the most important thing are the souls of those around me. And so I will do and I will give whatever I have to do and whatever I have to give to help save those souls and bring them to Christ. Paul was a man who was trained up to be a very prominent Jew. He, he was on track to be very successful and very highly regarded and very influential among the Jews. And he gave all of it up to follow Christ to become whatever he needed to become to whoever he needed to become it to so that he could save as many as he could and bring them to Christ. Humble, tireless in his efforts, a teacher, and similar to that widow that we just talked about, one who recognized that because of what Christ has done for me, I owe it all. And he was willing to put that into practice in his life. And then lastly, the ultimate example. The ultimate example of a giver. One that who in every way gave everything for us. And we could spend a long time looking at all of the passages of Scripture that talk about and illustrate just how much Jesus gave. I'm going to turn your attention to just a couple. In Mark chapter 10, for instance... In Mark chapter 10, and look with me beginning in verse number 41. And when the ten heard it, they began to be greatly displeased with James and John. James and John had asked a question further up in the chapter about who was the greatest and can we sit at your right hand in glory. So this is a response to that. But Jesus called them to himself and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. Yet, yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever, you desire, and whoever of you desires to be first shall be a slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. The Son of God left heaven to be a servant. He left the very place that the disciples think they're talking about and want to be at. He left the throne of God. He left heaven. Not to come to earth to be a king, not to come to earth to be uh, some wealthy leader of the Jews and to lead the revolt against the Romans that many thought he was coming to do. But he left to be a servant and to be a ransom for many. Paxton read for us from Philippians chapter 2 as Paul there reflects on the mindset of Jesus. And he looks back on him and remembers that he made himself of no reputation, that he took the form of a bondservant, that he became obedient to the point of death. Those are the traits that Paul sees when he looks back on Jesus. John chapter 13 a passage of scripture that 
is almost overwhelming to read as we think about Jesus interacting with his apostles very near the end of his life, very near the time in which many of them will leave him, which he will be betrayed. And what does he do? He stoops down and he washes their feet. Everything about Jesus screams servant. Everything about the way that he gave of himself, gave of his time, shows us that he was always thinking about other people. Not himself, but others. And it's in Jesus that we see not the I owe it all, mindset, as wonderful of a mindset as that is, but in Jesus we see the mindset of one who gave it all. He gave until he literally had nothing left to give. And in doing so, he sets the example for us. He shows us how someone who is willing to give it all can change the culture around him. His willingness to give it all has changed people's lives for 2,000 years, and it will continue to change people's lives until he returns. That's how powerful that willingness to be a giver can be. Sometimes we have no idea just how big of an impact our willingness to be that servant and to always be thinking about others and being willing to give until it hurts, until we have nothing left to give. Sometimes we don't realize just how big of an impact that can make. There's a great example of this playing out in Acts chapter 4 at the very outset of the church. We, we see there on, on the heels of the sermon that was preached in Acts chapter 2, and, and many were baptized into Christ. And we see a moment in time in which there are a lot of new Christians now in Jerusalem, many of whom had traveled to Jerusalem for the day of Pentecost and the feasts that surrounded that. And now there are thousands of Christians, new Christians, who have come to Christ in Jerusalem. And we see there in Acts chapter 4, specifically in verses 32 to 37, how their needs were met by those Christians in Jerusalem. Christians who were willing to sell whatever they had in order to provide for the needs of those saints who were there. And when that mindset of being a giver was ever present among the church there in Jerusalem, all needs were met. And the church grew at a remarkable rate. That's what happens when a group of people decide we are going to be givers. We are collectively going to be givers, and we individually are going to be givers. All needs are met, all ships are lifted. And the church grows as the love of Christ spreads, as others see and are drawn to this type of a mindset. And so I'm going to ask you again the question that I asked at the outset, is how do you identify as you think about these two types of people? And my guess is, if we're honest with ourselves, we can see ourselves in different places at different times. What I want to ask you to consider this morning is to take steps to train yourself to have the mindset that these people on the screen behind me had, to approach the world with a willingness to give, a willingness to serve, a willingness to be humble and selfless and generous. Recognizing that in doing so, we are simply following in the steps of our Lord. And in doing so, we are making ourselves more like Him. 
As we conclude this morning and we continue to think about these different mindsets that we can have, I want to again draw your attention back to the example that Jesus set for us. He came to be a ransom for many. He gave of his life so that you and I could be free from sin. And he asks us to come to him, to take advantage of the grace and the mercy that he brought to this earth so that we could have our sins washed away, so that we could be set free from the bondage of sin. And in doing so, we can be free to give of all that we have. Because now our hope doesn't rely in this earth around us. Our hope lies in heaven And it lies in things of an eternal nature. That's one of the beautiful things about being a child of God. Is that it frees us to be some of the most generous, most giving people that this world has ever seen. Because we have been freed from that bondage of sin and we walk in the footsteps of our Savior. And so if you're here this morning and you haven't become a child of God, I want you to consider the freedom that is to be found in doing just that. The freedom to give, the freedom to serve, the freedom to love that is found in Christ. And he is patiently waiting on as many that will come to come be a child of his. And we'd love to help you do that this morning. If you've done that in the past, but maybe, maybe you've thought about some of the things we've talked about this morning, and may, maybe you realize that uh, my life doesn't align with Christ's and some of the other examples that we talked about the way that I would like it to. As I mentioned at the outset, we're here to help one another. We're here to support and encourage one another, and we would love to help and support and encourage you in any way that we can. So if we can help you in any way, please come to the front and let us know how as we stand and sing.